I don't know about you, but I find it hard to feel equal compassion for two sides of a difficult situation. I find it easier to see the oppressed and the oppressor. I was watching the PBS NewsHour recently, and I saw a story about Border Patrol agents along the Rio Grande and their treatment of people crossing the border seeking asylum or equal opportunity. These were, the, these were agents who in the past had been instructed to separate mothers from their children. Now they were again being ordered to enforce the exclusion of migrants. And I found myself instinctively uncomfortable at the callous inhumanity I thought I saw with which these U.S. government employees were acting. And as I reflected on this judgment that I had made of these border agents, I realized, you know, I'm a U.S. government employee, or at least I was, and I found myself thinking back on my career in the State Department, thinking about situations I had confronted, particularly as a consular officer, and the choices I had made. My job as a consular officer, like those border agents, was to decide who could enter the United States and who would be turned away. The only difference between them, the border agents, and myself was that I did it in, the, in an air-conditioned office in an embassy. Did recalling this experience change my perception of these agents? Did their work change my judgment on what I had done? So I found myself thinking back to two incidents, one from my first assignment in the State Department and one just a few months ago. The first incident happened in 1983. I was a new Foreign Service officer. I was working in Kingston, Jamaica. My job was to interview Jamaicans applying for visitor's visa to the United States. Experience had shown us that large numbers of Jamaicans who received a visitor's visa and went to the United States would then stay illegally in the United States. So I and the other Foreign Service consular officers in Jamaica would routinely refuse up to 70% of everyone who applied for a visitor's visa. We would only issue visitor's visas to those who had well-paying, secure jobs that could not easily be duplicated in the U.S. And because of the incredibly high number of people who wanted these visas, we had to do interviews every day, hundreds sometimes, routinely making decisions in three minutes or less. Did we know these people whose lives, plans, dreams we were enabling or upending? No. We just had to grit our teeth, make a decision, and go on. It wasn't pleasant. It was difficult, impersonal, yes, even callous, but it was our job. About a year after I began this job, my sister came to visit. After all, Jamaica is a nice place to go to the beach. And so my wife and I took her one weekend to the beach resort of Ocho Rios. My sister and my wife were going to stay on at the beach for a few more days with our car, so I had to find a way back to Kingston without my car because I had to get to work on Monday. So that Sunday, they dropped me off at a traffic circle in Ocho Rios, which sort of served as an informal bus terminal for long distance minibuses. And I was nervously trying to figure out how I'd get a ride to Kingston without exposing myself to any of the violent crime then common in Jamaica. As I tried to figure this out, a man came up to me and said, do you remember me? Now, for a consular officer who routinely says no to people desperate to travel to America, the question, do you remember me, seemed a perilous opening. (laughs) Did I remember him? No, sir, I said, I don't remember you. Well, I applied for a visitor's visa, and I told you I had six minibuses, so I couldn't stay in the U.S. illegally, and you should give me a visa. I could see you didn't really believe me. But for some reason, you gave me a visa anyway. Four of my six minibuses are over there. 
The second one is going to Kingston. Get in it. <laughs> I gave a sigh of relief, paid my fare, and headed home to Kingston. Why had I trusted this man when I didn't trust so many others? I guess in three minutes or less, I saw in him an honest, hardworking person. Nothing extraordinary, but someone I could trust as a representative of the U.S. government. But why? Why had I mis mistrusted so many others? Surely many of them were as responsible, as decent, as hardworking as this minibus owner. Did I know them well enough to make that assessment? No, I did not. I made those choices because it was my job, difficult, impersonal, and yes, callous as it was. So my second incident happened about two months ago. I found myself looking back on my decisions about who could come to the U.S. and who could not. Once again, I was riding in a minibus. This time I was in the Colombian Andes uh, doing birding, which I highly recommend, by the way, with Michelle Tabasco and her husband, John Cahill. They were guiding me, my wife Sally, and five other birders to see the extraordinary wildlife of Colombia, having a marvelous time. Michelle's mother had established an eco lodge in the Montezuma National Park with her five daughters where we stayed. The idea of a single mother and five daughters establishing this kind of business in the machismo culture of Colombia is extraordinary. So extraordinary, it was the cover story for the Journal of the American Birding Association earlier this year. John and Michelle were the ideal guides and they have a very successful business leading birding tours in Colombia and in Guatemala. John's an American. His parents had moved to Guatemala with their family as Mennonite missionaries. John's grandparents, not surprisingly, live in the U.S. And Michelle told me she was frustrated that she could not get a visitor's visa to go to the U.S. to meet them. It's a very ordinary thing, isn't it? She wanted to meet her husband's grandparents, to see where he came from. And John's grandparents wanted to meet her. They wanted to get to know this extraordinary person their grandson had married. So, Michelle asked me, why can't I get a visitor's visa from the U.S. Embassy? I found myself thinking back to the hundreds or more of three-minute interviews I had done with visa applicants in Jamaica, and I imagined myself for a moment in the shoes of the U.S. Foreign Service officer interviewing visa applicants in Bogota, Colombia. Would I? issue a visitor's visa to this young, talented Colombian with excellent English? Uh-uh. No. I would worry she would visit her, parent, her husband's grandparents, stay and find a job. She would violate the terms of her visitor's visa. I tried politely to explain the wall of suspicion that kept her from visiting her in-laws. She was sad, perplexed, and frustrated. Would my refusal to grant Michelle a chance to meet her husband's family be wrong and inhumane? I think so. But I know I would have been doing my job as best I could in the difficult, impersonal, callous environment I worked in. And that brought me full circle back as I sat and watched the PBS NewsHour. I realized that what I had been doing was very little different from the Border Patrol agents enforcing U.S. immigration policy. Just like I had done, they would say they were doing the best they could in a brutal situation. They had no choice but to be callous. They're seizing other foreigners, many with small children, and putting them in hot, steamy detention centers to prevent illegal visitors. They are doing their jobs, the jobs we as American citizens and taxpayers have given them, and in very difficult circumstances. Unlike me, they did not exclude people while sitting in an air-conditioned office. They did it in the dusty heat of South Texas, in Arizona, New Mexico, California. Like those men and women on TV, I had been a border agent. I had ex enforced the exclusion of foreigners from the United States. Without having any less sympathy and pain and compassion for the migrants seeking safety and a better life by crossing the Rio Grande, 
I found myself trying to give the border agents the same sympathy and respect I thought I had deserved. As a Unitarian, I think I try to care for the marginalized and the dispossessed. How do I do that and still care for those government employees on the border and even have compassion for them as they do their jobs, even if I think maybe they're mistaken? Thank you.